Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm Aya Perez. I am your co-host and also the um, RFR online programming director. And I'm here with the amazing, fabulous, generous, lovely, wonderful Eric Wells, uh, who is also a co-host and also happens to be the support group director. So Eric, thank you so much for being here today and welcome back. Thank you. It is so good to be back. Um, I now have to live up to all of those different adjectives and that's not going to be difficult or not going to be easy to do so here we go but um like at the beginning of every rfrx we have a poll and that poll is designed to kind of get you into the mindset of what we're going to be talking about so the poll consists of four questions and i'm going to go ahead and read them out to you the first question is what values were important to you when you were a believer and it's got four answers faith hope love was uh, answer number one, integrity, honesty, or responsibility. Number two, truth, self-reflection, self community. Number three, or I was never a believer, not applicable. Question number two is, do values have a specific behavior inevitably linked to them? Uh, answer number one, yes, two, no, or uh, number question, or answer number three is not applicable. Question number three, where do you believe control of your life resides? Is it internal? external or is it a false choice? And question number four, how do you consider relationships changed for you since leaving or questioning your religious faith? Uh, the first answer is yes, relationships have become more important. Uh, answer two, yes, I've become more jaded on trusting others. Uh, answer number three, no, I'm still connected to the same people in the same way. And number, uh, answer number four is no, I continue to see relationships as guided by their chosen ideology. So those uh, whole questions, like I said, are going to kind of get you into the mindset of what we're going to be talking about, what our expert, our special guest today is going to be talking about. Um, I also want to give a shout out to the Atheist Community of Discord. They are um, streaming this uh, very program into their Discord channel, and we'll, there's uh, quite a few folks um, listening in today, and I'm very grateful to have you here. So welcome, guys. And if you are wanting to look for, find a community that uh, might have some like-minded people or engage in some great discussion, uh, make some new friends, um, check out the Atheist Community of Discord. We'll put a link in the chat. Um, all right, Amaya, why don't you tell us about what RFRX is? Basically, RFRX is a series of online weekly sessions where we bring in guests to discuss different topics that are relevant to anyone who is living religion or has left religion, or is just generally interested in topics that affect people who have left religion. Um, if you want to send us any sort of feedback, any ideas, any, I don't know, guests that you want to see in, in one of the sessions, all you have to do is send us an email to rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org. And if you want to watch any of our previous sessions, you can watch them in our YouTube channel. And now, uh, in Recovering From Religion, in general, as a charity, we have a mission statement. And that mission statement is that we offer hope, healing, and support to those who are struggling with issues of religion and nobody. Um, sorry, why don't you go ahead and talk about hope? You bet. You guys know the drill. You've heard me say this several times, but RFR um, pursues uh, the hope in their mission by the sharing and listening to personal stories. I mean, if I am reading our blog or I'm listening to the podcast and I can hear a story that uh, I can relate to and uh, kind of hear how this person went through it and um, what kind of got them on the other side, there's a good chance it may give me uh, some hope, a light at the end of the tunnel. And so honestly, listening to and kind of hearing these personal stories is uh, so, so important. And um, it really uh, helped me uh, make the transition much easier than I think it would have been being able to be around people who kind of had a similar experience. So we offer hope by uh, the sharing and listening to stories. And we've got our blog and our podcast to do that. And so those two links will be put into the chat. Amaya, tell us about healing. Uh, yes, so healing comes from our helpline, and this is basically a space where you can either chat or telephone call, and there are agents who listen to you with an empathetic ear and no judgment or criticism to any issues that you may have which are related to religion. This is completely confidential, available 24-7, and safe resource to use, so if you feel like you could really use someone that listens to you, please do contact one of our, one of our agents. They are trained to be lovely and super nice to you, and they will definitely help you out. 
And apart from this headline, we also have a resource page. And this is basically a website where we have collected a very, very large number of resources. And this includes everything from podcasts to blogs, to articles, books, videos, just anything you can imagine, you will find it there. And you can find um, specific resources for either a specific problem that you may have. So for example, if you are an ex-Christian or an ex-Muslim or you know any, any religion that you can think of, I'm sure we will find some sort of resource for you. So again, if you feel like you could really use a video or an article or a book or anything like that, do go to our resource page because we, we have a lot, a lot of resources there and I'm sure we'll, there'll be something for you there. So Eric, since you're the support group director, go ahead and you do your, your expert bit. Uh, do I have to? I really don't want to do this at all. <laughs> you're fired. <laughs> I'd love to do this. I'm the support group director and I love working with the support groups. It's something I've been doing for the last, uh, as a support group leader for the last five years. And it's made a huge difference um, volunteering and uh, just in my own life, but also helping with uh, helping other people too. So the support groups are these um, face-to-face meetings and we're doing them all virtually now. Face-to-face uh, -face meetings where folks can kind of work on the long-term healing that uh, often needs to happen when we're uh, coming out or healing from some trauma uh, or issues that have stemmed from religious uh, or religious past. It's often a place too where folks can come and feel comfortable asking the questions that they may not feel comfortable asking in uh, their current religious um, community. Uh, sometimes those questions are just not welcomed at all. Um, so we have over 50 groups around the world uh, and you can find the one nearest to you in, uh, on our website and I'll go ahead and um, put a link in the chat in a little bit for that. But uh, one of the meeting uh, groups I want to spotlight is uh, we have a Reno Sparks Nevada uh, group. So uh, if you are in that area or anywhere near um, Reno, just check it out. Uh, they got groups, uh, meetings happening on a regular basis, and um, it could really do, do some good for you. In addition to that, uh, we talked about two peer support uh, uh, programs available, both the helpline that Amaya talked about and the support group that I just talked about. These are support groups, uh, peer support, so uh, nobody's um, going to claim that they're trained uh, to be giving professional uh, mental health advice or help. And uh, But oftentimes we need that professional help. We need to kind of go beyond what peer support can offer, uh, what our friends and what our family can offer. And so we need the professional uh, to step in. And we have got a program, the Secular Therapy Project, which allows us as uh, people seeking mental health professionals, allows us to connect with someone who has been vetted or, or a, a bunch of uh, therapists in our area who have been vetted by um, uh, RFR uh, uh, therapist um, to make sure that number one, they have uh, appropriate licensing in their state or country to make sure that they maintain a secular practice and also to make sure that they use evidence-based treatments. So we've got the um, helpline that you can call in on a, for looking for resources or like really need to talk to. We've got the support groups, which is a place you can regularly come to, to work on and talk about some issues that continue to crop up or uh, uh, do some of that long-term work. And then we've got the Secular Therapy Project to assist with professional um, help. Um, Amaya, what else do you wanna talk about? We also have the online community, and this is a space in which you can chat and meet people that um, share similar backgrounds as you. So we have organized different groups. Um, so for example, we have a group only for females, only for LGBTQ plus people, um, I don't know, only for ex-military, uh, well, ex-members of the military. So we have all sorts of different groups. So if you feel like you could use just uh, that you will find it helpful to meet with somebody with someone that is from the same group as you and really does understand where you come from because they have gone through the same thing then i highly encourage you to join one of these groups is just contact one of our helpline agents and they will guide you through all the steps that you need to follow they do have a criteria so um you will have to meet like a specific um again criteria but um if you do meet it then there should be no problem and apart from these chats, they also hold Sunday night Zoom meetings. And I think now they are doing Tuesday meetings for people in different time zones. You will get, uh, you'll learn more about it once you join, but 
what I mean is that they do also have like Zoom meetings. And apart from the online community, before I jump to the actual RFRX session, I want to talk about volunteering because volunteering has been such a lovely thing in my life and I know in a lot of other fellow volunteers' life. It has been a saving grace during quarantine. I feel like I have spent a lot more time um, volunteering than doing anything that was like unproductive or just no, no um, productive to my mental health also. So if you feel like you want to just help other people, if you have a bit more extra time, if you just feel like RFR is a nice charity, please do consider volunteering for us. We have all sorts of different roles. You can develop your skills on roles that maybe you didn't think you would have, but um, you can also potentially just develop the skills that you already have. And it's just a great way of meeting people also because we have an amazing community. So I highly encourage you to join us. It's an amazing, it's an amazing charity truly. And if you do want to join us as a volunteer, all you have to do is go to our volunteering website and that is recoveringfromreligion.org slash volunteer. And there you'll find all the information that you need. Okay, and now Eric, let's jump to the actual RFRX session and let's start by explaining how it's gonna be just the structure. Heck yeah. Guys, like you know, every week we have a discussion with our expert. It lasts for about an hour. I'm going to talk about our topic, and uh, um, the expert's going to kind of go over what we need to talk about. And then during that conversation, there's going to be, um, it's going to, more likely than not, you're going to have a question that you're going to want to ask. So please either send us a uh, message with that question or type it, type it publicly into the chat, and uh, we will be sure to ask the expert that question during the second half of this discussion, the Q&A session. And that'll last about um, 20 minutes, 30 minutes or so. But um, even um, you folks over at the ACD, um, feel free to type in a question and we'll, we're got those, uh, we're monitoring that over there as well. After we have the Q&A session, we're going to hear a little bit from our uh, founder and president, Dr. Galloway. Who knows what's rattling around in that guy's head, uh, but he has got a lot to say and he's not ashamed to say it. So we're gonna hear some stuff from him. And um, uh, so once he's done with his little moment, uh, his more than 60 second moment, we're gonna shut the recording off. We're gonna open up the lines and uh, just kind of hang out. Uh, this will be an opportunity for you to hang out with one another and also to hang out with the guest if they have some time to hang out. All right. Um, Without further ado, Amaya, you want to bring on our guest and introduce them? Definitely, yeah. So today's guest is a first-time speaker in RFRX. We haven't had him yet. His name is David Teachout. And just as a brief bio, David grew up in Michigan, uh, which apparently is the home of taking the first day of hunting season off from school. Fun fact, didn't know that. Um, and went to a Bible college in his... Um, then quest to become a minister for Christianity. Pushes ensued, answers were not forthcoming, and the result was a life of studying humanity from a place of curiosity rather than condemnation. Right now, David uh, resides in the Seattle era, area with a career almost entirely focused on psychology, and he possesses a sometimes frustrating des desire to pursue complicated conversations. Thank you so much for being here today, and welcome. Thank you. Uh, I had actually forgotten a little bit of what I wrote in that intro, and every time I hear about Michigan, it always makes me laugh. Um, <laughs> it's no joke. It really is. It's Hunting is huge there, and you can take a day off from school, and nobody bats an eye. It's just, just yes, very amusing. It's a silly question. How many days can you take off going hunting from school? <laughs> Usually, it ended up being a few. Um, but, uh, given I grew up in the time which there was, there was a story in which a woman was shot, uh, by a hunter while getting her mail. And the story goes that he thought she was a really large bunny because she had white, um, furry gloves on and thought, well, that's the tail of a rabbit, right? Yeah, no. Um, yeah. Michigan. Good times. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Seeing Shannon in the chat. Yes. Uh, Michigan is a... Yeah. Well, and I went to Bible College in Grand Rapids, which I affectionately refer to as the buckle on the Bible belt. Um, and uh, I think last time I knew, there's only like two other cities in the entire continental U.S. that have more churches per square block or something than Grand Rapids. I mean, it's really, it's intense. It's, um, 
and, and part of it is because they've got like four religious universities there. So um, it's, yeah, pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. It's like a fun place. The first place I'll visit when I go to the to the US. <laughs> Michigan it can, it has some lovely places. Um, I prefer the mountains uh, out here on the West Coast. So um, yeah, not going anywhere, going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I, I was in, uh, uh, lived in Springfield, Missouri for quite a while. And uh, we played a game, see if we can get like from one end of the city to the other without passing a church. And nobody <laughs> ever won that. Nobody, no, won that nobody can ever do nobody, that. No, no. 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 Oh, no, so. when, I, when I lived, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, when I lived there, they could, yeah, when I lived there, they could still, they still had an ordinance in which you could not buy hard alcohol on Sundays. I think that's really? changed in the fit in like the 15 years I've been out here, but yeah, at, back in back when I was there, yeah. So, of course, everybody bought it Saturday night, it was like a major free for all for purchasing, but saying, but. Yeah, I was going to say, how else can you survive church on Sunday if you don't have that hard alcohol and, you know, vodka, whiskey, <laughs> whatever you guys drink in the U.S.? <laughs> well, given the fact that at the time I was probably the one street preaching against alcohol and any other kind of <laughs> sinful <laughs> behavior, um, <laughs> I didn't have much of a problem with it. But uh, So, uh, so yeah. how did you kind of uh, uh, get, what was your deconversion process like? I, uh, it was uh, interesting, you know, deconverting as a student in a Bible college is fun. Uh, <laughs> there, there was actually a group of us and that we had uh, really started delving into philosophy and uh, I had looked up this book. It's actually by uh, George H. Smith, uh, Atheism, the Case Against God. And I'd seen it on a shelf and a person basically went, no, take a year, study some more uh, presuppositionalism among other things. And then you can take a look at it. Um, during that year, I uh, became convinced of science and evolution, um, which then became very difficult to hold a literal translation of Genesis. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then got hold of the book again and like 50 pages in, I'm like, I'm out. Okay, now what? <laughs> I'm two years into this program, and I've now taken like a half dozen theology courses. What am I going to do? Um, so um, I did end up finishing uh, the program. I just switched to psych. Uh, and so basically kind of uh, double major focused on psychology and theology. Um, and not least because, quite frankly, it was a little bit out of spite. Um, because they didn't ever want to have somebody later on go, if you'd only stayed, you would have had your answers uh, given to you. Um, yeah. So now I can say that I graduated with honors and no, I did not find the answers there. So um, it's a, yeah, it's, it, it was a lot of fun. Um, but there was a whole group of us that went through a process and I think about half, about five of us actually deconverted. Um, and uh it was, um, it, it, honestly, it's probably some of the best memories I have. It, it was emotionally difficult, no joke about that. Um, but it was also just an incredible time of discovery, which from what I hear is what college is supposed to be about. Right. Um, so it was good, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so today's topic is um, identity, obviously, and I guess how we can move on from religious identity, because obviously uh, when you're in, a, in an organized religion, that religion is a massive, massive part of your identity, if not the defining factor. So, uh, And, you know, so identity is definitely going to be something we'll, we'll touch on. Um, and a lot of this has to do with, I mean, I don't know if anybody else in the room, anybody who might be listening later, um, Religion is more than just something that any of us have likely just believed. You know, it wasn't something that we, um, you know, to varying degrees, uh, just it wasn't like a, a, a set of clothing that we took on and off. It was the means by which we determine meaning and purpose and direction. I mean, when I left, it wasn't just, oh, well, now I get to go somewhere else. It was, what's the point? 
Like, <laughs> what what is the point to any of this? What, you know, fundamentally relationship with others, uh, relationship to values, which is what we're going to start off with, uh, relationship to, you know, sense of who I am, sexuality, uh, community development. I mean, literally everything, the reason for getting up in the morning uh, can be, I mean, it's kind of pulled out from under you. Um, and, and so, you know, anytime that I talk with anybody through this process, it's, it's something that, you know, I try to keep in mind, um, because I never want to think of this as, and I'll be the first one to joke around about various religious beliefs and my own journey and so on, but none of it's supposed to be meant as flippant, uh, because it really is serious. And I take very seriously anybody who holds to literally any belief uh, because it's a big deal. Um, and, and so getting into the values thing, um, what has happened since then is a kind of rewrite of how uh, you know, I find meaning at all, um, what it actually matters to me. And the there was a difficulty of course because when it comes to what matters or what i'm referring to as values here um for the longest time it's kind of given the the, the names are given um you know hence the first polling question you know it was like well, what what were these values that were so important to you and further not only were the values given to you, but the definition of them was particular behaviors were circumscribed. They were told like, here's how it is to be this way. And, you know, you can, you know, the whole thing of, uh, you know, by your, by their fruits, you'll know them. You know, this is, <laughs> it was an understanding that you could look at what somebody did and backtrack it to, to an, an acknowledgement of what they cared about. And therefore you knew we're together. We, we belong with one another. And there was some great coherence there. There's some great peace and consistency. And so part of the process then here is kind of looking at, okay, well, one, what are values? Um, where do we get them? You know, is now that we've, you know, left or in the process of leaving a kind of, um, authoritarian structure uh you know is it now going to be family is it going to be school uh, is it going to be society at large um do we even think about these things don't have to um but if anybody's going to be you know living a more reflective life and for those of us who have left in more than just a peak of of anger we did some reflection so our life isn't going to, we didn't stop asking questions <laughs> once we've left. If anything, we probably have more questions now than we did before because the sky's the limit. In fact, for that matter, sky isn't even the limit. Literally, space, I mean, like every, there is no <laughs> limit to what we can actually ask now, which uh, for the first few years, uh, you know, I have to, you know, be honest with myself. Had I encountered a group, of believers that actually allowed me to pursue as many questions as I wanted, odds are the process of leaving would have taken a very different route. Um, mm. I mean, it, it probably would have point. ended up the same way. Yeah, I mean, it, it probably would have ended up the same way eventually, but it certainly would have been different. It would have probably taken longer uh, because one of the reasons of leaving was going, no, this is here's the questions that you're allowed to ask. And then these are the ones that you're not allowed to ask. And, um, you know, which is fundamentally the whole story of Job. I mean, as someone who actually preached on, gave a couple of sermons on Job, you know, back in the day, you know, the, the, there's one way of looking at it, but frankly, I always looked at it as Job would, could do anything except question the authoritarian structure of God, period. Anything else was open. He could question his humanity. He could question his family. He could question his own goodness. But as soon as he questioned the authority structure, boom, 
plague. Like you are, here's where I got to step in and tell you to shut up. And, <laughs> and of course I'm sitting there having a predilection of being anti-authoritarian and not really appreciating <laughs> being told, um, you know, what I am and what I'm not allowed to, you know, ask. Um, so, but of course now the question ends up being left open of going, wait a minute. So now that I no longer have this ready-made structure, what the hell am I supposed to do with myself? How do I have morality? How do I have, you know, any of this? And this is not just some, you know, philosophical, like, you know, diatribe against atheism or anything where it's like, well, now you don't have God. Uh, how can you ever be moral? No, <laughs> but it is a question because now instead of having it being provided, we have to make it up ourselves. And so in some fashion. Um, and so I'm going to share an image real quick. Um, I don't want to keep it up very long because like being able to see everybody and what's going on. Um, and for anybody who wants um, these images or something, you can actually contact me anytime and I'll provide them. You can find them on my website as well. Um, Amaya, I'll send them to her as well and can be you know set up. Um, but I'm a real big believer in resources. I love just giving stuff out, having conversations. Um, so this is actually a structured work under for not only um, uh, my therapeutic practice, um, but a lot of what I uh, teach in like you know coaching and uh, just psych education. Um, but the idea here is that we have this process that we have our values. Uh, which are essentially a kind of cognitive shorthand uh, for what we care about. Um, and another way of looking at them is being triggered. And I don't mean triggered in, in the kind of uh, snowflake way. I mean triggered in the sense of any time we feel an emotional reaction, it's because something bumped up against either something that is really important to us that was either supported, like being given a hug um, by somebody we love, or it's been violated, i.e. when we were lied to, or otherwise, you know, called names, or, um, or were, you know, attacked for whatever reason. It's like something's been violated. Well, what is that? Well, that's something we care about. Now, we move through that and we go, okay, wait a minute. What do these things mean for me? And part of that is, is if I, <laughs> if I were to tell anybody, um, for instance, good family values or the group, you know, the, the Family Research Council, um, you'd probably have an immediate, uh, you know, recoil and go, wait a minute. Mm, no, not really big on that. At the same time, <laughs> I don't think any of us here probably stopped caring about family, honesty, integrity, truth, uh, you know, intimacy, the power of relationship, any of these things. We didn't stop caring about these things, but we sure define them a little differently. We look at them differently through a different lens now that we're constantly developing, one that hasn't been handed to us. And the whole purpose behind that then is that the way that we see what we care about informs and gives the structure for what we then do, how we respond to things. So any time that we are doing something, one way of looking at behavior, whether or not it's ours or somebody else's, is literally every behavior is to support something, a value that we care about either to show that this is the way we um, thank you for supporting in the same way I do, or in trying to showcase how we would like it to be supported. So part of what we're then going through here is kind of going, okay, well then how does, you know, this work in practice? You know, this, because let's face it, this is not actually a typical way that we talk about values. Um, I can think of immediately, like, uh, what was the big thing, um, you know, when the war on terror started and uh, George W. Bush came up, it's like, they don't really care about our values. 
well, that always kind of jarred me a bit. Um, and on the opposite, like, well, here's a, a candidate that cares about family values again. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> Different groups don't have the final say on what these things mean. You know, just because I say that I belong to the group of family values does not mean that other people can hold them. We just have to have a conversation about what they mean to one another. I mean, for that matter, even the people that we're supposedly fighting, quite often, I mean, I will fundamentally disagree with the behavior and their worldview, but to say somebody who's willing to sacrifice themselves for something that they believe in is lacking in integrity or honesty or doesn't care about their family. I mean, I don't know how anybody else out there who's like, how often are any of the people we know willing to sacrifice themselves for that? Mm -hmm. Now we can still fundamentally disagree there. It's totally fine. But how we go about it is not a matter of these values are mine and those are yours. It's now more of a question of how do we relate to one another in this, you know, in the world? And that's part of the process then of developing this identity, you know, post leaving, you know, our faith. And so I wanted to actually quote, um, well, actually there will be a, a list of um, uh, some, you know, books, again, resources. Uh, I swear in another life, I was a librarian. I'm still really big on providing as many literature as possible. Like, hey, read this, read that. Um, my Kindle library is filled with a few hundred books that I probably haven't read yet, um, but really plan on. So it will happen eventually, I will get to them. Um, but there's something from uh, Mark Johnson. Uh, he wrote Morality for Humans, uh, subtitle Ethical Understanding from the Perspective of Cognitive Science. Highly recommend uh, reading this. Um, just a fantastic way of, of exploring naturalistic ethics. Um, but he wrote, you know, moral deliberation, at its best is a process of reconstructing our experience in a way that resolves the morally problematic situation that is currently confronting us. Okay, makes sense. Such a process involves the only reasonable notion of transcendence available to humans, namely the ability to move beyond our current habits of thought and action to creatively remake some aspect of ourselves in our world. Like that's what we're all in the process of doing, having left our faith. We're remaking ourselves in some fashion. We just try to figure out a way to do so. And see, the, and he goes further on to go, there is nothing about such a process that takes us out of our skins as if we were somehow little gods capable of generating moral absolutes. Instead, imaginative moral deliberation is embedded, so socially embedded, embodied, so in these meat suits that we all uh, have, and enacted within our changing malleable experience. So that was a mouthful a bit, but Fundamentally, what it boils down to is, is kind of more of a, a more academic way of describing really what I just you know showed in the image is that we are engaged in this changing dynamic of figuring out how do I relate to myself, how do I relate to others, and how do I do it in a way that's frankly consistent and makes sense of my experience. I will say I will never be uh, asked to come on Oprah um, because I don't have ready-made answers uh, for all these things. Um, and I also think you probably have a greater sense of morality, but I won't go on my Oprah diatribe. Um, and so the, the issue here being is that, wait a minute, what then does this mean? How do we go about doing this? And part of this then, now that we've kind of looked at values, we're looking at this narrative or worldview idea. It's a big difference. Uh, between an ideology that comes from an authority uh, and one that is personally, consciously developed. And that 
that felt feeling, that difference is really a sense of ownership, a sense of responsibility, a sense of disconnect. Some people might know where I'm going. Like fundamentally, any time that an ideology is given to somebody via an authority figure or structure, there will always be a sense of disconnection going on between themselves and what is actually happening, which is where sin comes in. No joke. Like, <laughs> we're, you know, to, to kind of paraphrase Eric Fromm, you know, he's like, humankind is about the only creature that ever questions their purpose in life. You know, the cheetah doesn't ask, should I actually stalk and hunt this antelope? It just does its thing. Beavers create dams, not much thinking through that. They just go through the process. People are really the only one that goes, <clears throat> I don't belong. There's something weird going on. You know, there's nature and then there's me and not sure what, which frankly, is why authority draws us in because it helps us answer that. But it draws us in, of course, by perpetuating and feeding on that disconnect. So it's almost like a, um, well, it almost it practically is. It's like a socially made drug. Like the more, <laughs> and you get a Bible and you get a Bible. Absolutely. Like there's this idea that the more you feed into this, the more like there's this promise on the outside, there's a promise at the end of the road that eventually you're going to feel connection. You're going to feel great. Even as the actual ideology, the worldview, the way that you're thinking about yourself is to perpetuate the notion of disconnection and an, a, a kind of unfeeling for yourself which ultimately is actually one of the reasons why, you know, amongst many, uh, that I ended up leaving fundamentalism entirely. Not just fundamentalist religion, but fundamentalism of any variety, political, social, doesn't matter, is because at a level of, the, of a, a fundamentalist psychology is a deep-seated disconnection between who we are, who we feel about ourselves, and who we feel about our fellow people. And I just don't want that, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Like, that's just not, you know, what to go reminded of, um, was it Bertrand Russell, uh, who was like, said something along the lines of like, there's two things that fundamentally drive me. And one being a search for truth and two was a deep seated uh, empathy for the suffering of others. Something like that, my paraphrase. So don't quote me. <laughs> um, but it said something, it was like, you probably said it a whole lot more, you know, uh, quotable than I just made it. But, um, but that was fundamentally what it was. And, it, you know, it came, there was one of the things that it came across and going, you're right. Like, this is just fundamentally. So why would I want to be a part of something that at bone marrow deep is all about separating me from me and me from others? So, but of course, here's the trick about a worldview is that, you know, it determines what is to be considered as facts. You know, in this day and age of internet echo chambers and conspiracy theories, um, you know, the, the idea of, well, you, you know, what's the phrase that I've often used to use, don't anymore, but used to use of like, well, you can have your opinion, but you can't have your own facts. Well, from a certain perspective, facts don't exist in a bubble. They're not just these free floating things that we kind of snatch out of the air and go, ah, here's a fact, uh, here it is. Uh, facts have a structure, they have a way of connecting in the way that we, um, oh my, former diehard QAnon fan. Uh, yeah, you'd, you'd have a good conversation with my mother. Um, but you know, the thing here being is that um, facts exist within a certain structure, 
And that structure is a worldview. So when we look at things, we're literally being able to go, oh, this fact connects to this one, and then this goes to here, and ah, now it makes a triangle, or now it makes a square, or whatever we want. And and to do that, it provides then, you know, a sense of direction. Um, it allows us to go, what am I supposed to pay attention to? Hence, one of the polling questions about what mattered to you when you were a believer. What has changed since then? Um, you know, what personal resources should I be giving in this whole process? It provides, you know, a structure for determining, frankly, whether the world is safe, i.e. right. Because as soon as we think of things as being right, hmm, it's rather safe knowing that. Or uncertain, i.e. wrong. And then, of course, lastly, it creates a sense of community. This is why you know, I love the whole you know, opening part here, talking with you know, Eric and Amaya and all the sense of community that is being built. Because that is... <laughs> fundamentally what we end up losing. It's not just that sense of directions, that sense of interconnection. And from uh, uh, another, again, book, again, see, librarian, it's what it used to be, um, is from uh, Peter Block's uh, book, uh, Community. And he discusses this idea of being belonging. And he looks at it as having two different meanings. You know, first is that you have a sense of being related to and a part of something. It's membership, and you know, the experience of being at home in the broadest sense of the phrase. Belonging is best created when we join with other people in producing something that makes a place better. And secondly, it has to do with being an owner. Something belongs to me. So when we're Constructing a worldview, this is why one constantly pre continue to ask a ton of questions, try to be as humble as possible uh, to varying degrees of success, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, um, and to really sit there and kind of go, I have the feeling of thinking that I knew everything, that I had the source of all truth. I don't ever want to get back into that feeling before again, because again, fundamentalism, there's always a question of being wrong, either in part or in whole. And living that way is part of this whole processing, you know, creating that worldview. But that's where the whole sense of ownership of these things come in. And so one way of looking then at narrative is that it's a kind of, this is a broad term, holds both perspective, structure, and intentionality. So it allows us to make sense of the world and provides a direction on what, how we want to act within it. A whole lot more to it, but I won't keep going anymore about that. Um, and so we then come into like, okay, well, so now I know what I care about. It's still quite possible to care about the same things that I did even as a believer it's just that obviously the way that i care about them how they look in practice is obviously going to be a little different um you know financial security is still something that particularly for you know starving college students is obviously still something that is really important but you're not going to act on financial security by tithing to a church one of the uh, parables that kind of irritates me the most was that old, uh, the parable about the old lady giving like two pennies and the, the rich man kind of giving it like a lot, but it was hardly a dent in his, uh, uh, in his, his coffers in a sense. And, and, you know, kind of that, that is the one that irritates me the most, uh, or one of them that irritates me the most kind of along those lines. Absolutely. Well, and that's where to say, and that's really what a lot of any kind of fundamentalist ideology wants us to do, is they want to hold on to that it's not just behavior, it's meaning that they want to hold on. They want to be able to say, we own 
this value and we get to decide what behavior belongs in this circle of that value. And so we can look and go, nope, what you did over there was awful because it wasn't in our little circumspect gated community of this value. You know, this is why it's so freeing <laughs> and also can be extremely disconcerting uh, once we've left uh, that, you know, fundamentalism behind. And, and, and it's because we suddenly are open with this idea of, wait, I can give the two pennies or I can give a million dollars. Like, nobody's telling me what to do. Nobody's telling me, like, literally, I could do either one. And it's up to me to, do, to say what meaning was a part of it, uh, why I did it, give a justification, and use it as means of building the community around that action. Well, that's a lot of responsibility, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, which can be a little bit anxiety provoking. So, you know, there are still, I mean, it's been, I mean, I, I officially deconverted November of 2001. All sense of honesty, there are still nights, there's still days in which I get that sense of, oh, shit, <laughs> this is all on me. Okay, what am I <laughs> supposed to do with this? Um, there's a sense of um, both like incredible freedom, uh, like, oh, I, it's it's all me. But then there's also this sense of like, but it's all me and I could totally fuck it up. Um, it, yeah. it's just it's just odd. immediately I saw the two sides of that same coin it was really both freeing and frightening I think I totally normalize that like it th that is a completely natural understandable process of going through all of this this is my inner therapist coming out um, but you know it really is like it's easy to then take that sense of anxiety that sense of uncertainty and turn it back on ourselves and go, oh, I made a mistake, or perpetuate the idea that there's something wrong with us. And instead, we just kind of secularize it. You know, <laughs> instead of sin, now it's mental illness. Um, I almost don't want to say that because it's not the same thing. So don't leap on me about that. <laughs> but that's a whole other conversation. Um, but, you know, but it is, it's an easy way of then looking at like, oh, there's something still fundamentally wrong about not only even who I am, but what I am. Mm. And no, there isn't. <laughs> you're, you're just human, like the rest of us. And trying yeah, to I think that's one of the worst things about, about religion is this idea that we are all wrong, that we're all sinful, that we're dirty, and that we need to be safe. Like, that is such an awful concept. Like, of, like why like, I don't understand why religion had to have that. I mean, obviously, I guess it's because of uh, this feeling of controlling someone, because obviously, if they think that they need to be safe, then they're more likely to look for help. But it's just such an awful thing. And I feel like, especially, I feel like in the chat, there's been a couple of comments about children. And I'm, I just think that if you're a child and they're telling you that, that must be such a traumatic experience to grow up with, to think that you are just sinful. Mm -hmm. Well, and we see that quite often in groups. You know, we talk about uh, ideological purity testing. You know, it's like if you yeah. dare to question some sacrosanct idea, well, now you're no longer a Republican. You're no longer a Democrat. You know, it's this, everybody's walking around in this straight up, like, no true Scotsman fallacy. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's utterly absurd about, you know, if you don't believe this, then you're no longer. And it's like, really? Who, 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 who picked you as the final arbiter of what is and isn't belonging to this idea? Um, you know, the, the, what's going on quite often now of like, you know, ideas should be, you know, um, deny that we need to hide ourselves from certain things. All that is, 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 is a secularized version of religious fundamentalism. It's really all this boils down to. And then 
And, and the reason we need to hide ourselves from it is because there's some kind of fundamental wrongness in you based on, again, an immutable characteristic of skin color or uh, uh, race or whatever have you. And it's like, no, you know, whether or not you move it from humanity writ large or whether or not you put it in some kind of characteristics, the same process still applies. There's something wrong with you that you had no choice in the matter. And now you have to, you know, continue to walk through uh, this process of constant, uh, you know, self-flagellation. And it's like, no, humanity contains all of it. Thank you. Um, the good, the bad, the indifferent, and everything in between. Um, and that's part of this whole process then. It's like we have, you know, these things that we care about. We have this structure of what we're trying to figure out how this works. And then we're then trying to engage in the best way that we can with uh, the behavior that we have. And so part yeah, of... I was kind of born into this the family that believed uh, in the religion and you know grew up being told I was broken and so it's very hard to imagine a world or, or like what I would be or what a person could be who wasn't born into that wasn't grown up growing up kind of uh, told that they were broken at birth um, and had to be constantly redeeming and they'll never get get to this uh, this idealized state they'll always fall short um so it, it's um it's kind of like something that many of us have to struggle with uh just as a very basic part like how how do we kind of get over that um and and it affects our values so much too going forward so we have to work on right this this that sense of dis again coming back to that sense of disconnect you know, it's why, I mean, I don't know if anybody else out there has noticed, but I at least have noticed that there is a fair number of, you know, non-believers who then fall into other extremist, you know, often political ideologies. You know, there's, and it, and it happens, and I used to, you know, eh, okay, be perfectly honest, still do my fair judgment judgment about it. Um, I just try to <laughs> curb the judgment eventually. Um, but, don't be don't be a, don't be a uh, secular the, asshole, David. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but part of it is that there is that still felt feeling of going. There is a sense of continuity. Like I can get rid of God, but there's still that that feeling of uncertainty can be debilitating. It can be quite awful, yeah. awful. And when you then are given yet another structure where you don't have to, you know, prostrate yourself in a some sense of obeisance before an immaterial, you know, deity, now you can do something right in front of you and then it starts making sense of the world. It's like, oh yeah, um, okay, sign me up. It's nothing wrong. It's just, again, being human. We really, really, really don't like uncertainty. Um, we, we will literally continue awful, awful habits. We will continue getting engaged with awful people and poor relationship choices because, forgive the quote, but better the devil you know. <laughs> we love consistency. And if we can create this even out of awful behaviors, we will freaking do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah welcome that's to... an excellent point yeah, yeah like, <laughs> but on the, on the flip side flip side too living in a world where there isn't any supernatural being that um can change their mind out of, on a whim like based on somebody's uh supplication to them or something like that can totally change their mind uh, living in a world that is like uh run completely by um, physical processes. Um, obviously, the human interactions are not necessarily driven that way purely, but just the physical world being um, uh, dictated by rules that we're beginning to understand more and more. Um, it kind of feels a little more comforting. Like, I, I'm not going to get 
struck down because someone on the other side of the country prayed for me for something bad to happen to me or something like that. Most definitely. Most definitely. And there, you know, it was, you know, I'm, so I'm a avid reader um, and I, I love fiction. I love fantasy. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, starting off with uh you know uh, lord of the rings and like the third grade it was just like just put me in put me in front of a fantasy novel you're gonna lose me for a few hours and nerd <laughs> i very I love very it. much i, 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 I love wear it. it proudly and, yeah um, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> part of you know this thing is like you know anybody who reads this like oh, wouldn't it be cool if magic existed and you know and a friend at, at, long ago who, you know, kind of poked that bunny and um, and noted that going, but magic doesn't really make any sense. Like, it try, I mean, true, like it. We once you get past the cool factor, um, and you, you you start going down the path of like, wait a minute, there is then a fundamental part of my experience that makes no rational sense and cannot make any rational sense it will always be apart from me that's really disconcerting which is really what a supernatural sense gives you and so you're and that's where that flip side comes like you're describing getting rid of that even if and this is a whole broader conversation about whether or not we can ever know everything if even how we describe or define what everything means um is that at least now we have the potential like we literally are no longer living in a world in which the sun could be paused in the sky for the whim of a particular racial mm -hmm. identity yes like, yes yes wait <laughs> we know that things fundamentally work by certain laws and we're just trying to figure all this out. And once we do, it makes sense. And there's a structure to it. And we're like, Oh, okay. Talk about free in, in that sense. Like it's no longer, uh, you know, somebody may have mentioned, you know, caught vaguely in the chat about, you know, it's like, if you don't do such and such, I didn't go to church enough times, or I didn't say the rosary enough times, like therefore this. And I'm like, even as I was a believer, there was a point where it was like, you know, the Calvinist idea of not knowing whether or not you're elect. You know, one of the sins behind that, you know, that theological frame is that you shouldn't ever declare yourself as knowing you're saved because nobody really knows until they're oh. in front of Jesus. Oh, and so, so I know it's insane. Such a, I, I yeah. Anxiety provoking. That's a, so, what a huge wager. The more, like, why isn't, like, literally every believer, why isn't everybody in a constant fit of anxiety attacks? Because you don't know. You, you, you can't know. Like, the, 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 the very basis behind which you're trying to figure yourself out and everything else is a big old fat question mark. It's just... You know, this comes back to what's the definition of faith, the hope in the things that are unseen. Well, I kind of like to see it. Thank you. Um, of course, yeah. seeing is generically, you know, understood here. Um, ecological mess that you end up being in. And certainly um, part of then this process of forming this new identity post faith is to find a new equilibrium or a new way of relating oneself to your own self, but then other people in a way that allows for uncertainty without the moral weight behind it. Like we can sit here and go, I don't know. And not yeah. feel like there is something fundamentally wrong with us. Like, Oh, okay. It's okay. Um, and this is where, in part of the way of mitigating that is in this kind of value structure is being able to look at. So this is a uh, you know something else that uh, Eric Fromm mentioned. It's like value judgments are applicable to man and his interests only. Such value judgments, however, are not mere statements of likes and dislikes. They're not you know for man's properties are intrinsic to the species. 
and thus common to all. Like what we care about, like imagine there is not a single person out there that doesn't at some level concern themselves with integrity, honesty, trust, uh, family, and, you know, keep filling in the blanks. Even, even the complete and utter sociopath <laughs> is, you know, is somebody who at, low, at some level still is deeply concerned with truth because they want to know what it is in order to twist around it. I mean, so there's still that point where it's like there is a value there, even though we can utterly disagree with how they're trying to go about living their life. Um, exactly. Somebody just mentioned, you know, MLK Jr. I mean, there's, there's a reason why both one, he's almost universally uh, admired and universally used in all, by all sorts of different groups <laughs> to buttress their own arguments, often contradicting one another. Because he was a deeply human person, just, and so as a consequence, he's like, I care about these things, but I care about them in a particular social context. How does this work out in practice? And he was figuring it out just like the rest of us, to varying degrees of success. And so when we look at, you know, that worldview, it's not just that it shapes the values, it shapes how you look at them, it, it, it develops how you think about yourself as a human being. Uh, it's an intrinsic part of how you relate to one another. And so we always like to kind of get to the part of like, okay, well, how does, what's some stuff that I can take home? <laughs> like how do we go about, you know, trying to help out some of these things and put this into practice? And so one thing is really delving into values. Like I know I kind of harp on this a bit, Part of it is just because that's what I fundamentally talk about all the time. Um, but uh, you can actually go through and uh, like I have actually a couple of worksheets um, that are free uh, that are just how to explore what, you know, what matters to you. What are your values lists? Um, and then you start exploring your worldviews. And by this, I mean more than just academic literature. I love the next philosophical text as much as the next person. But we are more than just a quote unquote rational mind. We're a relational one. And so literally talk with different people, particularly ones that you disagree with. Um, read fiction. Yes, carte blanche, go out, read the latest. Uh, oh, I love the Dresden series. You know, read fiction, read, you know, what, do some Netflixing, you know, f explore these different stories, how people relate to one another. Look at other cultures. This isn't about all cultures are the same. It has to do with various cultures have tried figuring out how to relate to the world in different ways. And the more that you broaden how your brain is taking things in, the more equipped you are to be flexible in responding to the inevitable uncertainties that is life. And that's really what we're about here is flexibility, is to give us more awareness, more information to go, oh, I've done it this mm -hmm. way before, and that kind of worked, but maybe I can try this variation or I can try this one. And so then that comes into you know, behavior. And it's like, literally try new things. Identify others, you know, who embody those values that you just deeply appreciate. How, how did they, what did they do to support them? And it's not necessarily about mimicking them per se, but it's about how did they go about it? Is there some version of what they did that I could bring into my own life? Hmm, I don't know. Um, and then, of course, asking yourself, because behavior is both an expression of what we care about and a way of trying to shape the world to have it make sense, then really we, we can ask ourselves, huh, what am I doing? How is what I am doing shaping the world? What world am I making even in these little things? And there's a whole exploration of, uh, of Kant's categorical imperative for those who wanna go into that. Another conversation. Um, and then, of course, lastly, uh, you know, is honestly practicing mindfulness and meditation. I know <laughs> mindfulness at times can get, you know, uh, it's almost like it's everywhere. But the reality is, is 
our conscious experience is who we are and the more we explore it yeah the more flexible we become in in seeing what's out there you're almost what you're suggesting is um using your exploration to sort of like create a values library in a sense like you uh you can observe what uh works for you what you like what you don't like what values you hold uh are important to you, what values are not, and kind of set them in a library. And like for me, there's books that I go back to time and time again that are important to me. They have their their uh, meaning to me. I get a sense of fulfillment out of them. And then there's books that are like, I'm I'm not even through the first two chapters and I've lost interest. I mean, this is not a, something for me. But so it sounds like you're suggesting to kind of go explore and uh, almost do uh, grow your library of, of values. Is that am I am I somewhat close? Absolutely. In fact, I when I work with uh, clients or other, you know, it's um, I often will describe it as because you know, in the value listing and the exploration of that is that you're essentially creating a thesaurus for mm, your mind. Thesaurus. You're like you're figuring out yeah all of these things that you resonate with and that you're going hmm. Well, this behavior was to support this, but it was also supporting this other thing. And but when I did it, it got in the way of this other value that I appreciate. So now I can think back of was it worth it? Was the give and take worth it? Um, is maybe I want to do a variation on it um, and so on. And so yeah. then you're constantly okay. exploring the best version of yourself that you at least currently know how to be. And of course, what what is present is always collapsing into the next future. So we're in this constant, you know, evolutionary, you know, development process. And I was uh, looking at um, so Stephen Batchelor, uh, who I cannot recommend enough. He's just an amazing writer, um, but he wrote uh, one book on being the Confessions of a Buddhist Atheist. And he was looking at, and this is a guy who's serious bona fides. He's actually a, one of the main trans, translators for the Dalai Lama. He was up there in the echelons of uh, Buddhism. And um, he wrote how being in the world means that I am inextricably knit into the fabric of the fluid indivisible and contingent reality I share with others. There is no room for a disembodied mind or soul, however subtle, to float free from this condition, to contemplate it from a hypothetical Archimedean point outside. We are knit. You know, it's why I refer to my, you know, uh, my private business as life weavings, because we are knit together. We're trying to figure out how we work in this weaving apparatus of our lives. How can we figure out and find this kind of golden thread to help us, you know, guide us through this? And eventually we figure out there's a whole bunch of them. And the more aware we are of the ones that we're following, the better. That's beautiful. It's really cool. Very cool. But uh, this has been a great discussion. Thank you so much. Um, we have a uh, couple of uh, questions. Amai, you want to kick us off with the uh, questions? Uh, yeah. So the first question that we have here is, uh, where can I find a new identity after living religion? So where can I start if before I felt like everything of my life was related to religion and now I just don't have that anymore and I, I don't know what to waste my values on? I just don't know what where to base my my life overall on. Um, so, do you have any advice for those people who are struggling in that in that area? I hope I've provided at least a beginning uh, process uh, for being able to help out uh, with that. Um, I heard you talk a lot about just um, picking up some books uh, yeah, and and also exploring, um, almost yes. uh, maybe uh, having conversations with people you might not otherwise think to have conversations with. This is recognizing that we don't just have one identity. You know, we can refer to this as like you know the hats that we wear. 
you know, all of us are, you know, the, you know, have parents, uh, we have friends, we're maybe student or former student or, um, uh, you know, a political group to, you know, atheist or agnostic or, you know, it's like we have all of these labels that we hold ourselves to. And so part of the process of finding an identity is kind of honestly to realize that there is no singularity here, that we will shape ourselves and, you know, looking at our humanity as a kind of uh, kaleidoscope. Um, so I'll, oh, I'm totally going to cool. date myself here. <laughs> yes. So yeah. I'm going to date myself here. So anybody grew up with those stories of those little things you put up to your eye and you've got all these colorful, you know, rocks or whatever at the end and you turn you it. Like a, it makes a kaleidoscope? Changes. Exactly. A kaleidoscope. Yes. So <laughs> I love that. So, I was so confused. <laughs> I know when everything came around, I was like, okay, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we're going there. Exactly. I already said it. Um, but that's really <laughs> what all of us are figuring out. Like we all have these set amount of stuff that we're rearranging. And even the subtlest of changes, we don't stop being us. We just have a slightly different facet of how things are showing up. And yet again, there's another avenue of exploration. And, and there's the trap like we're, that fundamentalism brings is that it tricks you into thinking that you're just this one thing and you're not, thankfully. I mean, and I'm rather happy I'm not just one thing because if I was just one thing, then the first time I ever lied, it would mean that I'm now a liar for all of eternity. Well, that would suck. So, yeah. Yeah, it is difficult for me personally to... Um, uh, how do I say this? Uh, like I get down on myself when I find that I've made a mistake in my thinking or like um, in the in the past uh, when I uh, used some inappropriate slurs or made fun of people inappropriately. Um, it's it's hard for me to like come back and say, hey, that was a different me and I'm I'm working to constantly become better. And so it's it's really hard for me to like not give myself that uh, that that okay to to um, grow and and change, I guess, or be flawed in the past and still flawed currently. Yeah, mm, I don't know. Yeah. And that's where I mean, <laughs> grace has a unfortunate historical connotation with some things, but <laughs> I mean, there's there's a there's a definite truth to holding us in a state of, hey, it's okay to allow for that period of growth and forgiveness and self-reflection. That's great, thank you. Um, someone else asks, I struggle with the inadequacy of any moral theory. Consequentialism makes sense in many contexts, but it's absurd in some contexts. Virtue ethics makes sense in many contexts, but it provides little useful guidance in many specific contexts. Uh, deontology makes sense in some contexts, but it's absurd in others. Do you have any candidates for a comprehensive moral theory that would, then, that would make sense everywhere, I guess? I'll go back to, I actually quoted him earlier, uh, Mark Johnson's Morality for Humans. Um, and it, it's just a phenomenal naturalistic uh, morality book. Um, it, it it really is. It it really pulled together a couple of decades um, of study into a, a pretty comprehensive whole for me. Um, and I would add, I mean, definitely there's some aspects of Eric Fromm. Uh, in fact, even the Big Picture by Sean Carroll uh, has a fabulous way of, of kind of a, a um, how do you put it, a, a poetic naturalism is definitely something that I resonate a lot with. Um, and one, that book is amazing, um, if you're into physics, especially. Um, but his his explanation of it, you know, poetic naturalism, it really is just, it's 
really, really nicely done. Thank you. Uh, and then we have one last question, unless someone else um, send us another one. Eric, do you wanna do you wanna get this one? Is the relinquishment of a man-made concept of sin is it core to establishing self worth and defining a purpose once uh, an, uh, an individual kind of removes that supernatural thinking um, uh, and also kind of removes the religious based moral compass? So, do you think that? Uh, in order to kind of move forward, we have to uh, uh, drop the concept of sin um, uh, and the religious based morals compass. Or does that get us locked into a, a yes. rigid structure? Yeah, like I spoke about it previously about, you know, I've left all forms of fundamentalism behind. Um, and as far as sin is concerned, yeah. Honestly, I think it's probably one of the most pernicious, psychologically yeah. damaging ideas that has ever been created by human beings. I, 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 in fact, I don't even know, I don't have the words to describe how awful that idea is. Because it, it is, I, 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 I come, honestly, I come right up to referring to it as child abuse, even though that's not what I call it because that has a whole lot of problems attached to that. But it's just, there's something deeply disturbing about an idea that says nothing you do matters because fundamentally at a almost cellular level, you are inherently wrong. And not even wrong in the sense that you've done something wrong. You're wrong in the sense that you, you're antithetical to what is possibly to be right or good or any of it. Like that, that level of disconnect is just so debilitating. And, and, and it's something that I wish out of all the absurdities <laughs> that people think that really is the one that I wish I could just excise uh, from creation. And I'm one that loves exploring ideas, but that's one I would love to just utterly remove. Yeah, and like here in the, the world that we live in, um, if I do something wrong, if I quote unquote sin, then I have the ability to uh, make good uh, either by uh, doing some good deeds or if I do something really bad I can serve some time and uh, you know in the, or do some community service and so in a sense I can offset what wrong I've done by doing some good stuff and uh, in the religion I was raised or uh, raised in that was not the case no matter how much good I did um, there was no way to undo this original sin or even any sin, let alone uh, like no matter how big or so small, unless I simply um, uh, came pleading to the supernatural being and asked for forgiveness. Like I couldn't do good things to offset uh, the mistakes I made or the bad things I did. Uh, we have actually received a couple more questions. So I'm just gonna quickly, <laughs> quickly ask them. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, so one of them is, would you accept fundamentalism if the intent and evidence was good? Sure. I mean, <laughs> I mean it's one of those where, you know, it's, um, <laughs> so with caveats, <laughs> um, you, the, the difficulty with fundamentalism is that it, fundamentalism is less a ideology and more of a characteristic of, so it's a, it is a, the almost like a feeling base behind how one views the world. It's a characteristic of an ideology. It's not in itself. And fundamentalism fundamentally um, has to do with the idea of there is unquestioned, unquestionable ideas um, that, um, that there are sacrosanct ideas that are um, uh, unassailable. And kind of an ideal, you know, I'm kind of an intellectual libertarian when it comes to that kind of thing. Um, everything should be capable of being questioned and we should be free to ask ourselves anything. Um, so I, I don't, 
So in one level, sure, evidence makes sense. I'm fully capable of saying, yeah, it was wrong. Part or whole about anything. On the other hand, um, I'm not sure what evidence would necessarily count towards something that says now this is no longer capable of being questioned, like you've reached the pinnacle of this and none shall pass afterwards. Uh, so much of what you said uh, rang true and um, very, very appreciative of your time. Uh, David, um, I've put a list of resources in that you provided for us into the chat. So thank you so much. And um, also I'll, I'll put it again too, but if you want to find out more about uh, learn about more about David and some of the resources he has on his website, check it out. Um, David, we've got a hangout after, after um, the old man, Daryl says whatever rambling words he has to say, uh, we got a hangout. And if you um, have some time, can you uh, hang out with us and, and, after we stop the recording absolutely fantastic thank you thank you so so much um amaya why don't you uh take us on to tell us what's going on next week uh yeah so next week we're going to have uh the topic of shunning which is very very common as you all know in um religion different religions and uh, the person who is coming um, she, her name is Kathy S. Harris, and she's an ex-Jehovah's Witness. So she's going to um, do a presentation, deliver a presentation on how to deal with shunning, because it's a very common practice. If you have been affected by it, if you know someone that has been affected by it, if you're just curious about it, I definitely recommend you to join us next week. She's amazing. Kathy is such a lovely, lovely person. Any of our previous YouTube, uh, sorry, RFRX sessions will be in our YouTube channel. And if you want to send us any ideas for topics or any feedback on how we can make these sessions better, please do send us an email to rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org. We'd love to hear what you have to say. We also have a blog and a podcast whose links are going to be in the chat. And now without further ado, um, we're going to have the amazing, wonderful and lovely Dr. Daryl Ray uh, giving us our 60 RFR seconds. Oh darn, I only get 60 seconds. All right, well, I'm gonna blow that out of the water here. Um... Eric, I'm sorry I'm, I ramble on too much sometimes, but I want to ramble on, so for goodness. So I just want to say, David, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, you, this did not disappoint. I was really looking forward to this because I thought, okay, this is going to give a lot of people some ideas to think about. Uh, an old uh, mentor of mine years ago used to say, he who has the most tools can fix the most cars. And of course, that was in reference to behavioral flexibility, thinking flexibility. And so what I found is, you know, some people are too flexible in their thinking. In other words, they can never make up their mind. They can never land on a particular values that they want to work within. But that's not the problem with most people. Most people are, are trapped by ideology. And I call it the ideology trap. And I, I think you and I are on the same page about almost everything you said. I really appreciate the way you did it. But if you're trapped, I, I think we all have to be very aware of when we're getting trapped by an ideology, and, and that means we can no longer ask questions. And the minute you can't ask questions, you're, you're probably trapped. And I've got some very strong values in my life, but I look back 20 years ago, and some of those values I've developed since then or some of those values I've switched and changed. So they're not permanent. They can be changed, and hopefully I've, I and other people have got enough behavioral flexibility to adapt so that we're more effective in the world. I think that's really what you were saying is how can we be most effective in this world and have the best life? So that's my two cents on what you just told us. So thank you. So, so as far as the RFR moment, I just wanna encourage everyone. This is, this is the beginning of the holiday season, of course, and RFR helped a lot of people right now. Our volunteers are talking to people who are having to deal with all sorts of shit um, at their homes over Thanksgiving supper. And they're afraid of having, some people aren't, aren't even going home for co Christmas because of COVID and they're happy about that, of course. But uh, those who are going home are, are having to deal with this. So there's, there's, there's lots of things that our volunteers are doing. And I, I hope you will support our volunteers. If you see a volunteer in our chat line, if you see a volunteer in our community, tell them thank you. 
for all that they're doing because this this is an endeavor a labor of love and there's there's over 200 people here doing what Abaya and Eric are doing and uh, and many other volunteers are in our our meeting tonight as well. Also, it requires money to do this. So we would love it if you would go online, look at the donate page and become a regular donor to Recovering from Religion. If you come here every week and enjoy this, then please support us. We don't require anybody. You don't have to tithe to us. Uh, although I am the high priest of the Church of Flying Spaghetti Monster, and I do require you to tithe to me personally, but you don't have to tithe to RFR. And Eric, I haven't seen that check you said was coming yet. So <laughs> just want to want you to know. <laughs> no, we uh, we are the church. We don't. We try not to act like one either. So um, go volunteer uh, if you want. If you want to help somebody else, you might find a place to volunteer here at Recovering from Religion as well. You don't just have to volunteer doing what things like uh, Maya and Eric are doing. You could volunteer as a chat line agent, as a support group agent. You could support in other other places. You could write a write for our blog. We have lots of people. Some of the people listening right now have written articles for our blog. So there's a lot of different things you can do, and I haven't even begun to name them all. So again, Eric, Maya, thanks for all you're doing tonight. Um, where's the giggler? David. I'm sorry, oh. I'm talking about Tom. Tom, thanks for doing the Discord for us. And David, thanks for doing the talk for us tonight. Mm -hmm.